the Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I am a huge fan of. I always say if you want to make money in this YouTube game, you got to create more content than you consume. But I will admit that I consume a lot of this gentleman's content. <laughs> he is one of the few YouTube channels that I watch consistently myself. His name is Rich Cooper, and he's got a channel called Entrepreneurs and Cars, but it dives into a lot of different topics, a lot of those that we'll get into today. So Rich, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Yeah, thanks for having me, George. Appreciate it. Yeah, so your channel talks about three things specifically, and I actually have an interest in these three, three things. Number one, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, fast cars. And number three, women. And I actually like all three of those things. So that's probably why I watch your channel so much. But for my viewers and listeners who don't know your full backstory, uh, you know, from your entrepreneurial days to how you kind of went down the, the red pill rabbit hole and mm -hmm. your channel uh, changed, you know, quite significantly. You went in a different direction where you thought you could be better service. But could you tell us that whole story? It's really fascinating. Yeah, I started the channel in 2014 when I was exiting my uh, business, which I started in 2003. And I basically built something that I didn't really love that much anymore. Yeah. Um, and I was at a conference and I was talking to all these guys that were either with very successful YouTube channels or starting them up. And um, I just cooked up the idea of marrying up uh, entrepreneurship with cars and basically interviewing my friends and their success rides. Um, but I ran out of friends with cool cars real fast. So I did like five episodes. <laughs> you can go back to the very beginning and sort by the oldest and you'll see those. But um, they were fun. You know, I really enjoy talking to friends about, you know, some of the obstacles that they kind of went through and trying to like mash that into like a top gear sort of episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I just started running out of things to talk about with cars because my friends all kind of dried up with cool cars or they were too far away and it didn't make sense to you know, fly and, and edit and produce all the stuff at great distances. So I just kind of started to do what I called like in between episodes where I would talk about entrepreneurship, um, how I would use parties to hire people, um, how I would use lawyers in my business to get the most out of them. Mm -hmm. All of these kind of like in between sort of ideas and guys started to rely on me for what I was talking about. And one day a guy came along and said, Hey, you should do a video on the kind of women not to date. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Cause uh, I got lots of experience with that. And um, <laughs> I had just broken up with a, a single mommy that I was dating after, which I dated for about uh, three years after my divorce. And I started right. kind of diving into this like rabbit hole of um, what is called the red pill. And it really started with um, those types of videos. And then uh, somebody recommended a, a book called The Rational Mail to me. Right. Um, and I know you're familiar with Rolo and, yeah. um, that, that took me to an even deeper place, which I found uh, fascinating because it was like the superpower that um, I never had before, understanding yeah. what women really respond to and how to get more out of life. And it wasn't just applying it to women. It was applying it to all areas of my life, which I called unplugging, basically right. unplugging from the comforting lies and understanding the uncomfortable truths because comforting lies sell really well to people. Yeah, that's right. So what are some of those comforting uh, lies that, that we've been told that you've discovered through your uh, journey and your research? Um, well, some of the more obvious ones are just be a nice guy and she's going to love you into perpetuity sort of thing. Or, yeah. um, you know, if you just get married, you're going to have uh, access to love and, uh, you know, a loving supporting partner, you know, for the rest of your life sort of thing. Um, there's lots of narratives that kind of like dovetail off that, that really go into complex areas. But I think the nice guy, be a friend, be less so she can become more. A lot of those narratives really don't serve uh, both men and women in the long term. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I had this question written down and it kind of pertains to what you're referring to from my standpoint. But, uh, you, you know, when I try to explain to people like the being red pill aware or what, what, what that whole concept is when you're talking about understanding the psychology between men and women. Uh, if I have to explain it to someone very quickly, I'll say, well, it, again, it's that psychology, but it's understanding the psychology of what drives men and what drives women uh, in their long-term uh, mate selection. Mm -hmm. um, but especially with women, you've you got to understand that women date sideways and up. 
And, and once you really understand that, I think a lot of uh, what you're just talking about falls into place. Like if guys, you know, they think that once they get married, uh, that's it. You've got a partner that's just going to love you forever. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can just sit on the couch and do nothing and be, you know, quote unquote loser and not pursue excellence and all, and, you know, and you're never going to have a problem. She's still going to be there. And that's just not true. It's not true. And you can't. Yeah. And also, you know, I see so many, uh, especially young guys, you know, they, they think all they have to do to get that, uh, to build that relationship equity, I think is what you call it, is just be the nicest guy you can possibly be. Just bend over backwards, yeah. you know, be the nice guy. And, and I'm not saying be a jerk, but I always tell people that if you really want to understand the red pill, if you want to use it to your benefit, you, you've got to understand that, that that doesn't cut it. What really cuts it is pursuing excellence. Did, would, would you say I'm I'm accurate there. Or how would you describe it? Yeah. So what you're talking about is the ego investments that guys make into long-term relationships or marriages. And, and what they typically think is, okay, so I'll buy the house in a neighborhood that she wants. We'll have the kids, uh, you know, the total number of kids that she wants to have. I'll renovate the bathroom and the kitchen and the en suites. And I'll do everything that she wants. I'll hang up the curtains that she wants and the crystal chandelier. Yeah. And all that equity that they put into the relationship is like a bank account that they can make deposits on that they'll be able to make withdrawals later. Um, and it's simply not true. There's, um, there's a concept called Berfault's Law. Um, you may have heard of it. I think I've heard you talk about it a couple of times, but I, I don't recall what it is. Yeah. So um, you can probably sum it up nice and easy for a newer audience with Chris Rock's soundbite from his tam tambourine uh, standup, where he said something along the lies, lines of only women, children, and dogs are loved unconditionally. Men are only loved under the condition that they provide something. There you and go. that's basically yeah. what or false law is distilled down to. But um, yeah, with guys, you can't rest on these laurels. You can't think that you can make, you know, well, I committed to her and I married her. So she's always going to be by, by my side forever and ever until death do us part. It doesn't matter what vows you've taken. Um, women and female nature specifically uh, are operate quite differently from what we've been told. And, you know, to your point of, of chasing excellence, you know, it's one of the sound bites that I probably use the most often on my channel. And I appreciate that you've heard it and you've started to say it as well too but um yeah you can't relax in life as a guy there's no days off for you maybe a day off or an afternoon off on father's day or something like that but there's no you know time off for you from chasing excellence and being on your purpose uh usually the clock starts cl uh, ticking down to the end of the relationship the moment that the guy starts to relax. Um, often guys find that when their wives start to make more money than them, they get promoted to more successful positions. They may get laid off. Uh, they start to get fat or lazy. They start to accumulate a nice coating of Cheeto dust on their beard from watching sports too much. <laughs> All of these things in some combination or another are indicative of a guy that's not on his purpose. And women pick up on that. Like women, yeah. generally speaking, need to wake up every day and look over at their guy and say, yeah, this is the best I can do. I'm real happy with him. Yeah. And that, that boils down to a respect to a certain degree, doesn't it? They've got to respect well, the guy. Yeah. Like she's got to respect him. You know, she's got to look up to him. Um, I did an interview a long time ago with this um, woman over in Holland and she said, and she said something that really stuck out to me. She said, you've got to look up to your man. Like he's a giant, not like, you know, physically he's 18 feet tall or anything like right. that, but women want to look up to a guy that looks like a giant to them. They, they don't want to look across or down. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And what's great is I think for guys, you know, you need to understand that that's with, within your control, you know, that respect, you, you can't expect it to just be given for no reason. Uh, you, as a guy, you have to go out there and earn it uh, every single day. And um, you can say that it's unfair. Uh, women can say that certain things are unfair, but it just doesn't matter because that's the way we're hardwired and that's the way the world works. You don't have so, that right as a man to complain or say that anything's unfair. Nobody will listen to you. They'll just mock you, generally speaking, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But but I think it's such a powerful message. And that's why, you know, I, I, I say that all the time. Uh, you know, pursue excellence. Uh, don't pursue women, especially the young guys out there, you know, because if once you start finding yourself, uh, 
you know, with, with all that attention that you have and all that energy, once you find yourself pursuing women to try to get married, to try to start that family, uh, it, it's going to take you down a path where you're going to get neither. You know, it's like that quote from Ben Franklin about freedom and safety. I don't know if, if you recall that one, but he says, basically, you know, those people that pursue safety over freedom uh, deserve neither. And it's the same thing with guys. If you pursue women over excellence, you're going to end up with, with, with neither of them. So you've got it. But if you pursue excellence first and foremost, then magically you're going to have an abundance of both. I think. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because there's a soundbite that I picked up on from a retreat that we had facilitated in an entrepreneur's group I was at in 2013. And he said something along the lines of, um, playing to win versus playing not to lose. And I have a playlist on my YouTube channel that I titled play to win. Yeah. Um, but they sound similar, but they're, but they're distinctly different. Men need to play to win in life. Um, it's okay for women to play, not to lose. Like women will generally play it safer. They're more risk adverse. Um, so guys can't adopt the playing not to lose, you know, mentality in life. I mean, a lot of guys can and do, but they're not going to get the better results out of life that the guys are getting that are playing to win, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, I'm going to hammer this home one more time. So, so everyone's on the same page guys, if you're not having success in your relationship, it most likely isn't a result of you, um, not buying your your girlfriend or your wife enough flowers or being nice enough on mother's day or taking them to dinner once a week it, it may have something to do with that but the the major root most likely i know it's not the same across the board but the probabilities are very high that the reason is because that there's a, a loss of respect there because you're not making a, a dent in the world like i think rich you say all the time, you know, you got to go out there and make your dent in the universe is what mm -hmm. you say, I think. Yeah. So what tips would you give to guys that are out there and they're, they're pursuing excellence because it's not just making more money. I mean, that's kind of what most people think. Well, I've got to make more money. And although that is a component of it, it's not the complete picture. It's, it's one part of the equation. Of course, you know, when it comes to women, they love a guy that can make it rain. They like a resourceful man. Um, it's one of the great equalizers. You know, I share the story about this guy that owned uh, three eight story office buildings um, when I used to work in the collection industry back in the 90s in Toronto. And he used to keep this uh, row of exotic cars. So, you know, as a car guy yourself, like you'd really appreciate you know, yeah. the lineup. There was Ferraris, Lambos. Uh, there was a Z8, you know, convertible, the old uh, yeah. James Bond, you know, Beamer. Um, but all very limited edition cars, low production. And he was a little Danny DeVito looking dude, like short, balding, <laughs> fat. Uh, but he had bank. Like he had uh, money in abundance. And he would always be down there, um, you know, once a week swapping out a car that he would keep stored down in one of these buildings in the underground for another one. And on his arm, he always had some arm candy. And it was new arm candy every time. Um, so, yeah, money does make a difference, but it's not the end all be all. Um, see, women are okay to be with a younger guy that's 20 years old, like a hot dude that's like 20 years old if he has a plan. You know, yeah, right. but yeah. they don't have a lot of patience for a 40 or 50 year old guy that might still look attractive with a plan, right? Yeah. By that time in your life, you've got to have had, had done something. You have to have had accumulated some wealth. You've had to put some sort of dent in the universe. You'd have to have some sort of influence. Um, you know, people would have to recognize you, obviously. Yeah. So there's all of those components that, that, that really tied into it. But then there's also, you know, looks, there's money, of course. Status is important to women. Um, status is very important to women because, you know, from the hunter gatherer days, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, women's chance of survival would go up dramatically if they pair bonded with a high status guy that was a leader um, that yeah. other people in the tribe would look towards. He had great genes. He was able to provide. He could hunt. He could gather all that sort of stuff. So status is really important too. The optics of uh, health are really important as well. Uh, and that'd probably be the last one out of the bunch is guys don't understand or don't put enough emphasis, I don't think anyway, on the optics of masculinity, broad shoulders, narrow waist. There's a ratio called the 1.62 golden ratio. Yeah. And your shoulders should measure about 1.62 the, the width of your waist. Hmm. But something like two thirds of the North American population are categorically obese, morbidly obese, you know, somewhere in that area. 
And that's something that's really easy to control with just diet and exercise. Guys were like, well, you know, what do you do, Rich? How do I, how do I stay fit? Like, you know, you have the answer, move more, eat better. Like everything is available for free on the internet. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's something that I even work on too, uh, constantly, you know, a lot of people see me in my videos and I'm a pretty thin guy. I'm uh, six foot four, but I don't, I, I look, I don't know if it's that specific ratio, but I know that my shoulders are too narrow. Uh, that's just a, it's just kind of my body type mm -hmm. where, where my shoulders are, are real narrow. So, you know, whenever I go to the gym, I'm always trying to focus on what can I do to improve my, my shoulders, you know, cause it's just kind of a, a goal that I've set for myself. Um, unfortunately I don't have time to go to the gym enough and uh, the time to eat enough protein to make it happen. But when I go on spurts, you know, for like six months when I can really focus and allocate my time and energy, I do see a, a big difference there. So just People a personal, it. yeah, People it's a personal it when story you walk in for, a room, right? I mean, you know, when you walk in a room and you command the attention with presence, because you know, you look good, women look at you because they want to be with you and men look at you because they want to be like you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I I think that's a lot of what this boils down to. So you were a very and still are a very successful entrepreneur. So let's dive down that path a little bit because I know a lot of my listeners, especially the young uh, men and women, want to start a business. Uh, you know, especially in today's economy, you know, it's very difficult uh, to get ahead by doing anything else, really. You know, mm -hmm. with the job market and uh, with the economy. So what what you know, what did you do? How did you make it happen? And what were the things that you learned along the way? I mean, if you had to talk to your 20 year old self today, <laughs> and, and give you advice on how to be a successful entrepreneur, what would you tell yourself? If I would listen, so let's just assume that I'm going to listen to 20, which most 20 year olds <laughs> probably <laughs> wouldn't. Yeah, but if I'm exactly. going to listen to the advice of this old, bald, bearded man, um, you know, as he sits his younger version down, um, I'd probably have words for him along the lines of take bigger risks, um, work harder, um, spend less time chasing women, spend more time chasing excellence. Yeah. Right. Um, I'd give him the lecture about how your sexual marketplace value as a guy increases as you get older and, and, and stop having such a, uh, a scarcity mindset around women. Um, you know, for men, we usually peak around 35, you know, in our late thirties, you know, 35, 40, you know, somewhere in and around there. Um, women peak much younger because men are success objects to women and women are beauty objects to men. And it's always been that way, you know, throughout history. Um, but as far as that guy goes, those would be the main talking points that I would give him would be, you know, specifically focused on chasing excellence, not women and, and take bigger risks because when you're 20, you can mess up many times, you know, you can trip, fall down, break a few bones, scrape your knee, but get back up and get back up many, many times. Um, as long as you don't lo lose, you know, you got to take every lesson and learn from it. Um, you've got a lot of runway in front of you as a 20 year old, 50 yeah. year old guys don't, you know, they've got to be more targeted with what they're doing, especially if they're starting up a business. Hopefully they've had some success by now, but 20 year olds can make, you know, quite a lot of mistakes and still, you know, come back from it very, very easily. Yeah. You know, talk about how important it is to take action. And I mean, we, we hear that all the time and it's, it's, it's obviously cliche, but, but it, it, it's so true. And so many people out there, and I, I see this with investors and people who are, are, are wanting to be an entrepreneur is they get this uh, paralysis of analysis mm -hmm. where they're trying to plan out their business for the next five, 10 years before they even set up an LLC or mm -hmm. something like that. And, and I always try to encourage those people. I say, listen, just get in, get off the couch and do something no matter how badly it sucks or how bad it fails, it doesn't matter because you're gonna, you, what you're going to find and what I've, uh, in my life, I found that it's never the, 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 what ends up happening three years down the road was never the plan to begin with. Never, ever, ever. You're just throwing 10 things up against a wall just to see which stick. And then the ones that do stick, then you iterate on those ideas until you come to something that's working well and then you do more of that but is and i know you work with a lot of men in this area of uh entrepreneurship so, so do you see that as well where it's just hard for them to to take action because they're just stuck in their head and then if so what do you do 
to help them, um, you know, get off the couch and just not be afraid to fail and understand how important that that iteration process is. Yeah, those are great points. So the so the two things that come to mind is one, the entire purpose of a business is to make money. It's not I mean, a lot of people come at me with businesses or business ideas that they hate or that it's more of a hobby or nobody's willing to exchange whatever product or service that they're offering for their hard earned money. Uh, if, if people aren't throwing money at your business and it's different, I mean, there's other types of businesses where it might be user acquisition because it's software as a service and, you know, there's no money being thrown at the person, but, um, they have to have a genuine interest in what it is that you're selling. And ideally you should be able to generate raving, raving fans very, very quickly and easily. So there's that component of it is it's, it's gotta make money. People have to want to use it and throw money at it. The second thing is when it comes to entrepreneurship is, and I don't think that this gets discussed nearly enough as it should be, but mm. the most important skill that you need to have as an entrepreneur is the ability to solve problems because there that's all running a business is. That's it's right. A, it's that's a right. sequence of problems that are going to come your way, whether it's marketing, uh, human resources, legal issues, accounting, uh, closing sales, customer issues. It's a sequence of problems that come mm -hmm. at you. And if you cannot solve problems, you're not going to be successful at a business. So you better be, be, you better be good at solving problems when it comes to entrepreneurship. Yeah. I always say you have to be able to solve problems and manage people. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, most guys are not trained to be problem solvers. We're trained to be compliant. We're trained to nod our heads and say yes and whatever you need. And um, they don't like to think outside of the box. They're not conditioned to be creative problem solvers anymore. We're, we're mostly conditioned to be sheep today. Yeah. So do you think that something to have that mindset and to be a good problem solver and understand how to manage people and do it well and be decisive, do you think that's something you need to be born with or it's something that, that you can learn? Uh, I think it can be both. I mean, you could be born with it, but society could um, neuter it out of you you know, over time very quickly as a function of conditioning, or you could be born with no problem solving ability, but as a function of, you know, conditioning in your uh, youth growing up, you had to solve problems. Um, but if you intentionally approach life as a sequence of problems that you need to solve um, and embrace the grind, like you have to actually like solving problems because otherwise you're just going to give up, you know, yeah. obstacles will fall in your way. And quite often the obstacle can become the way um, you know, a, a mm. quote from Ryan Holiday's book, but, um, that's, that's what it is. You know, you, you're either going to find a solution or you're going to find an excuse. And if you're finding solutions, you're on the right track. If you find yourself, you know, finding excuses more often than not, you're really going to struggle to be successful with that business. Yeah. So what are some of the, the, the tricks you use in your own life to stay motivated? Because it's it, none of us are perfect. You know, none of us wake up every single day with just this massive amount of ambition to go out there and tackle the world and go to the gym for three hours. I know I, you know, I, I suffer from this all the time. It's a, I think, you know, relatively speaking, I'm a lot more motivated than the, the average Joe, let's say. Um, but, you know, sometimes I don't want to do a YouTube video. You know, sometimes I don't want to go to the gym or do these things that I know I should be doing to pursue excellence in my own life. So, so what are the tricks that Rich Cooper uses to stay motivated? You know what? I'm 48 this year. So, you know, I've spent a good part of my life, especially in my 30s, grinding, chasing excellence, putting a dent to universe, laying the groundwork so that I live the life that I live today. And it's not that I've lightened up that much, but I'm a lot more. I mean, people that have known me for a long time would say, you know, Rich, you've, you know, you've kind of cooled your jets a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I've set myself up today where I've basically retired from my main business. I'm now a company of one. I like it that way. I don't want employees. I want the ability to, hey, you know what? If the weather's grayed out, I'm going to head up to the boat club and, you know, grab the bow rider and spend the day on the uh, lake with my girlfriend sort of thing. Right. Um, I like having that flexibility in my life and the ability to make those choices when I want to make those choices. But it's only because I've done the work and I've laid, laid the groundwork in the past. So to the point of how do you stay motivated? I think it just boils down to like, you, you know, you got to want it bad enough, you know, guys say, well, you know, how do I get fit? You know, for example, well, you got to want it bad enough, you know, you have to make ch better choices throughout your day, you have to eat properly, you have to move better, you have to make sure that you've conditioned yourself to sleep well, so that you can recover. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of things that you've got to consider, but you got to want it bad enough, you know, at the end of the day. Do you have routines? Is it because, and the reason I ask that is because for, for me, I, I, I think if I do something consistently, and I don't know, there's some psychological rule there. I don't know if it's 21 times or 30 times or something like that. But as an example, let's say that I'm, uh, you know, I haven't been to the gym for a while. And, uh, you know, you really don't feel like going, but I know that if I go, let's say two weeks in a row and make it routine and at the same time, it'll get to the point where if I don't go to the gym at that time, then it feels kind of awkward. Mm-hmm. And, and like, like I, then I really want to go I'm I'm kind of creating that habit through routine. Do you do that as well? Yeah, I, th- I think the science on that is something like after 90 days, it, it, it really becomes a habit for you. Yeah, something like um, that. And I found the same thing. Like I go to the dojo and I train in uh, striking mostly these days. So boxing and yeah. you know, if my guy's off because now he's off every other week because of his work schedule outside of training. Um, and I notice, like if I've had a week off and I've had to train with the other instructor who does mostly crab drills, you know, like crab Maga and some of the cardio conditioning, when I come back to the boxing stuff two weeks later, I'm a little soft, you know, I've gotten a mm-hmm. little, you know, squiggly with, some of the movements and some of the reactions. So um, yeah, you got to stay on it, right? It's, there's no day days off as a guy when you're chasing excellence. It, it's, it's, it's grind. It's grind. Yeah. I mean, there are times in your life where you're going to have to take time off because something, you know, significant gets in the way and it's, and it's unavoidable, but return back to that grind, you know, as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. And so I, I know you, you've done a lot of research with testosterone as well. Yeah. And I think that's a big component of, of, of staying driven, you know, just the chemicals in our brain. So yeah. can, can you give us kind of the reader, reader's digest version on the research that you've done on that? And it's, it's not a, a panacea by any means, and people need to be very careful, but it may be something that people should, or guys should, should at least get checked. Yeah. So I, so I covered this in a chapter in my book as well on managing your endocrine system as you get older as a guy, because what ends up happening, well, with women, they go through menopause, right? And then it's quite obvious to them. They stop dropping eggs. They're no longer fertile. Their entire endocrine system changes dramatically overnight. Um, For guys, we go through a process called andropause and your testosterone levels drop about one or 2% a year from the age of 25 to 30 on until you're dead sort of thing. So by the time you get to your 40s, and I didn't notice this until about 43, really, uh, but by the time you're going to get in your 40s, you're going to find that if you've spent your younger years working out, being athletic, um, you're going to find that you're going to get weaker, slower, and fatter. And it's not going to happen overnight, but there's going to be days where, I mean, for me, I started noticing when I was going to the gym, I just didn't have the strength that I normally had. I didn't have the drive, the energy. One of the things that I noticed from um, an interesting interview that I caught a few months ago, and I can't remember who the two guys were talking, but the researcher said something along the lines of testosterone makes effort feel good. And Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, that's some profound stuff right there. It's true. Because Mm -hmm. when you've got your endocrine system firing on all cylinders, and and you're fully balanced, and your testosterone is the right level, and your estrogen, and your fats, and your lipids, and your DHEA, and all the other stuff they check with the panels is all good. Um, you're that much more productive. So I can put it this way. I mean, I started TRT, which is testosterone replacement therapy around the age of 43. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's completely changed my life. I've made more money than I ever have before um, working in a more, I'm going to say efficient way possible. Um, I just feel fully optimized. Like I feel great. I feel like I'm, I'm 30 years old basically is the way that that your hormone panel should be optimized. So it's a really important thing, you know, for guys to look at and consider, but most guys don't, they just avoid it. Or if they start talking about it, then they often get shamed for it too. Mm. Yeah. I think Rogan um, does that uh, quite extensively in his own life. I've heard him mention that on several podcasts. Yeah. From what I understand, he started at 39, but he's got a uh, GH protocol with his TRT. So, um, GH is growth hormone, which is a great way to repair, to burn fat. Uh, it's quite expensive though, but they don't offer it that much, or it's, it's, it's a lot harder to get in Canada because doctors have lost their licenses, you know, because of it. Oh, okay. uh, but, but GH is definitely something to consider if you're in the U S as well. And you're an older guy. What, what should guys be careful about? 
Oh, there's so many things. Um, Along, you know, with the TRT stuff, it's like I said, it's not a panacea and it's not for everyone. So who is it for and who's it not for? Well, it's for anybody that's essentially uh, feeling like crap, like they have the um, symptoms of low T. Um, And the problem is, is that with men today, like our testosterone levels are quite a bit lower than what they were a thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. If you want to learn more about that, there's a book called Estrogeneration written by a guy called Dr. Anthony J. Um, I had him on for an interview. We talked in length about how there's all these environmental estrogens, which are being thrown at us all day long as a function of, um, uh, everything from water to toiletries to sunscreens to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of this stuff changes the way that our body functions. And it uh, creates, it creates problems, you know, for us to work in an optimized way. So if you're starting to feel symptoms of low T, which are things like uh, moodiness, lack of focus, lack of productivity, muscle wasting, um, fat accumulation, you're no longer waking up with morning wood in the morning, sexual function is starting (laughs) to deteriorate. Um, there's all kinds of symptoms that usually pop up at some point. And there's probably guys watching this right now going, yep, yep. mm -hmm, Yeah. Okay. So if those symptoms start to pop up, then start Googling for a hormone replacement therapy clinic where you live in your city. There's some online places that do telemedicine and get your blood panels checked. And, um, before you commit to something like TRT, which is essentially a lifelong commitment, because you have to do it for the rest of your life once you start, which at the end of the day is not that inconvenient. It takes me two or three minutes every day to deal with what I got to deal with. Um, you know, if your blood panel shows that you're deficient, do everything that you can to raise it naturally. But if your body's not responding to, you know, natural inputs and, and the self care that you're applying to it to try to get the levels back up. Okay. No problem. You know, therapeutic testosterone is cheap. Uh, it's highly effective and it's not that big of a deal to administer on a regular basis. Yeah. That's interesting. So Rich, let, let's go back to the, the, the red pill stuff for a moment. And I know that you've got a daughter. I, I hear you talk about her periodically. I'm not sure how old she is. I'm guessing she's maybe getting into her teenage years now. Yeah, tween years, yeah. Yeah, but so understanding what you know about red pill and the dynamics at play here, how do you uh, use that in, in raising your daughter? And, and so and maybe another question may be, why is understanding the dynamics of the, the red pill or being red pill aware just as important for women as it is for men? Well, because society lies to women too. You know, they, they feed women a different set of lies that um, don't serve them. But, um, you know, like I started having conversations with her even as soon as, um, you know, four or five years ago, when I first started to dive down this sort of thing, like I remember one time we were at the uh, city tax office, because I had to drop off some checks for property taxes on a um, building. And, um, you know, the typical government worker behind the desk, uh, short purple hair, (laughs) sleeve tattoos, you know, overweight, obese, you know, a borderline, you know, perhaps diabetic. And I walk away, and I said to her, I go, so what'd you think of her hair color? And she's like, well, that's, well, that's pretty. Right. I said, oh, OK. And what did you think of the tattoos up and down her arms? She's like, eh, nothing really. You know, she didn't really have an opinion on it. So I just started to engage her in a conversation. I'm like, well, you know, one of the things you got to understand as a lady, you know, when, you know, when you grow up and you become a woman is guys aren't particularly attracted to bright, obnoxious colors like, you know, blue, purple, bright, <laughs> orange, green, you know, things like that. Uh, men typically prefer feminine cues. And you start to kind of go down the list and you walk her down this more conventional uh, narrative around what a feminine type of woman looks like. Because if you don't have those conversations and you leave her to her own devices to stare at screens all day or to let school or society or uh, TV or something like that, train her, um, she's going to grow up thinking that, you know, conventional feminism, or or sorry, conventionally feminine women are nothing to consider. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great point. So does she watch your videos now? I'm sure she's probably uh, tripped across (laughs) them at some point by now, but they're not particularly interesting to a tweeny girl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's, it's, you know, it's still conversations that I'll have with her from time to time about, you know, the dynamics of desire and arousal, you know, whatever's age appropriate for, her, obviously. Yeah. 
Now, so you you briefly touched on your your journey going from where you started, uh, kind of at the uh, the last stage of your entrepreneurial journey, and and dating that that uh, single mom gal, you know, after your divorce and stumbling uh, upon the the rational male, and then going down that rabbit hole and where it's taking you today. But that was quite a long an extensive journey, quite a roller coaster ride, I'm sure. So, but but now, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like it, just watching your content that you're going through a similar type of journey from a standpoint of personal freedom uh, because yeah. of what you've experienced in Canada in 2020. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if so, if that's the case, then kind of explain to us the journey that you've been on, um, maybe more extensively with the red pill, and then uh, what you're doing now with your personal freedom journey. Yeah, so um, I've always been pretty much a libertarian most of my life. You know, I like personal freedom and the ability to make more of my own choices without the government interfering and telling me what to do with my money or stealing it from me. So, um, you know, for those that are watching from places outside of Canada, the uh, top tax rate in my income bracket is 53%. You pay half, uh, sorry, a 50% capital gains tax on any gains you make on investments outside of your retirement portfolio. Uh, we have some of the most expensive um, like housing costs in the Western world. I could go right down the list. And plus, you're living in a place that's cold seven months of the year, uh, very liberalized and socialized. And the ongoing narrative is, you know, more and more like all you hear being shouted at you all the time is about inclusivity and acceptance and all that sort of stuff. And that's fine. I mean, if if that's what people want to vote for here and that's what they want to see more of, then that's going to continue. But I've seen the writing on the wall and the, like the straw that broke the camel's back for me was basically being here during the lockdowns. Cause this has been, and still is one of the most lockdown places in the world. Like yeah, you still yeah. can't go to a restaurant with your family and sit down at a table inside and have a dinner. That's still prohibited. Huh. Um, so I basically had enough of that and I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, I'm going to die one day. So, you know, how do I want to live out the autumn years of my life? Cause I've, cause I've basically got less life in front of me than what I had behind me at my age right now. So how am I going to plan that out? And really it's do, do more stuff that I like in places that I like. And one of the things that I've been real fond of lately, I've, I've watched quite a lot of sailing videos on YouTube. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, it's like, moths to a flame you know for me it's like an oh a new sailing video comes out let's go check that out and i'm trying to consume all this information about it because one of my big plans is all right you know i'll probably get myself a sailboat at some point when my yeah. daughter's grown up and she's you know on her own and see what it's like maybe sailing the mediterranean or the caribbean or maybe even around the world um i've never done it before it, there's there's obviously a lot of things that are involved with trying to hash that out but i'll be spending less time here in canada as i get older so to answer that question, it's, it's, it's really, you know, it really comes back to the whole mental point of origin thing, which is, you know, how does this serve me? Like, is this what I really want to do? Am I really doing what I want to do? Mm, yeah, that's right. And so, and, you know, I had a discussion with a guy uh, yesterday or the day prior naming, named uh, Simon uh, Mikhailovich. And he is someone that uh, fled Russia communist Russia mm -hmm. in 1978 when he was 19 years old. And so he talks about how uh, it was to live in Russia during that time frame and comparisons uh, to, to what he saw then to the United States and what's happening in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And the, the similarities are absolutely uh, unbelievable. Yeah, it's and, funny you say that. I've got a friend from communist Yugoslavia that said the exact same thing to me. Yeah, and, and you know, I asked him, I said, Simon, why did you guys come to the United States? And it was kind of a setup question mm -hmm. because I, 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 I knew he would say, well, it was kind of this area of freedom culturally. It was similar uh, to uh, Russia and whatnot. Um, but I asked him, okay, so it sounds like today in the united states canada australia new zealand we're, we might not be completely at the place communist russia was in 1978 but but we're, we're on that path so if you were a 19 year old today in canada where's your 
United States. Mm -hmm. And he said, George, he says, that's the problem. He goes, there isn't one. There isn't one because it's the whole Western world that has gone down this path. So I, I'm sure that's something that you've discovered in your, in your research and how to be more free as an, as a sovereign individual. So yeah. uh, how, how, have you put any thought into that? I, I know you've talked about the Cayman Islands and, and the sailing plan, but um, you know, where, where, where would you go to have a, a bit of culture and some of the things that you've enjoyed uh, experiencing in Canada or the Western world? Yeah. Well, I mean, culture is interesting because if you want to immerse yourself in a culture, you can just travel to a, a country and spend some time there and boom, you know, you're now in that culture. But um, yeah, I agree with the observation because I've had people say to me, you know, well, Rich, rather than, you know, becoming a resident of the Cayman Islands or this island in the Caribbean or Portugal or something like this, because there are places in the world that still treat you better. Like in Portugal, there's no uh, taxes on your crypto gains. You know, for mm. example, there's places in the Caribbean where you don't pay any kind of income taxes. You might have to make an investment in a real estate or an investment in the country, but there's different ways to deal with that. Um, but there's guys that have said, Hey, you know, you should come down to the States, come down to Florida, come down to Texas sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, I see that they're open and I see that it's mostly a red state, but I also see there's a lot of people from New York and California that are moving to those states because <laughs> yeah, exactly. they got fed up with their lifestyle that they voted for in that state. And now they're going to this state, but they also start voting for, um, you know, socialist agendas and policies yeah. and less freedoms in that area. So I don't, I don't see things improving. Like I don't see things getting better in most Western countries, which is why I'm more of the thinking of let's have multiple passports, maybe, you know, become more sovereign. Um, maybe uh, your sailboat, you know, becomes your principal residence. I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. I got to figure this out still yeah, I'm right. kind of on a walkabout right. on it, but, right. um, I don't see picking up and, and maybe moving to a place like Florida or Texas as the solution, because like you mentioned, it's, it's spreading, you know, and it's like, okay, maybe Texas is better than California. Maybe Florida is better than New York, you know, as far as personal freedoms and taxation and many other boxes that you want to tick off, but um, it's not getting more free. It's getting less free, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you another hard question, which I, I think you've, you've thought about quite extensively. And, and it's, it's one that I just can't figure out. But, but we know as guys that, uh, you know, from a legal standpoint, uh, marriage is something that, that doesn't make a lot of uh, sense uh, from a guy's standpoint. And I, I'm not here to say that marriage is bad or anything, but if you look at the legal deal that that guys sign up for there's the risk reward often is is, is pretty bad uh to say the least but on the on the same uh hand you know a lot of guys out there they want to have kids they they want to have a family they, they mm -hmm. want to do these things it's, it's it's only natural you know that's the way we're hardwired so uh, w what advice do you have for a guy that wants to have kids that wants to have that family but yet they look at the, the from a legal standpoint uh, of marriage and they're like, yeah, boy, I really don't like that risk reward. I mean, where, what, what's the solution for that? Is there a solution for that? I don't think there's a cookie cutter, um, easy solution. I, I mean, like, you know, as you know, I've you know written this book and I have a chapter in the book on why smart men don't marry. Uh, there's also elements, you know, throughout the book as well, which um, covers some of the other things that will reduce the risk exposure to getting ground through the divorce machine. Um, but things like uh, vetting your wife properly and you don't need to get married to have kids. Okay. That's, that's a, I mean, marriage today doesn't serve the purpose that it, that it was intended to serve when it was created you know, yeah. a long time ago. Um, it's we, like as men, you used to have responsibility and authority in your household you no longer have authority. It's been stripped away completely in most Western countries, but what you still have is responsibility. And how can you have responsibility to a family that you're supposed to lead if you don't have any authority to run it? So there's that problem. So I would look for living in places where you still have a degree of authority as you know the head of the household. You would want to look for and vet your uh, kid's mother properly. Um, Far too many guys rush into a relationship or a marriage or knock up a girl very quickly. Um, and there's one thing that you can control when it comes to relationships, and it's 
be in control of the birth. Make sure that you're not making any kind of silly mistakes, knocking up the wrong girl, because you're on the hook for a long time, buddy. And once the sperm leaves your body, you can't make any choices whatsoever. It's unilaterally the balls in her court and you got to go with whatever she wants to go with. So mm -hmm. you definitely want to spend some time vetting the woman that you're planning on having kids with as good mother stock, you know, as silly as that sounds, but you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of red flags that can fly up. And, you know, again, in the book, I've got a chapter that, that, that covers 20 of the main red flags that guys need to be careful of, but um, you definitely want to vet for those red flags and not do it over a short period of time and think, okay, you know, well, I've been with her for six months, so everything's good. So let's get married and have kids now. It's like, no, whoa, whoa slow down because um, you need to apply stress to that relationship. You need to travel with her and have the baggage lost. You need to get, uh, you know, mm. stuck up in a crappy area of, of right. some third world country and see right. how you guys can deal with that. You need to apply some stress to the relationship to see how she's going to respond to that. Because if you have some difficulty when stress is applied to it, well, guess what, man, marriage and kids is a lot of stress. There's a lot of things that will come your way that you're going to have to deal with. So you got to see what she's made of. Right. Um, so there's really a lot of things to consider. I mean, we could spend hours talking about all of them, but from a, from a broad perspective at, at 30,000 feet of altitude, those would be the main things to look at. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It, it reminds me of a story. Uh, my, my favorite investor is a guy named Jim Rogers. And I don't know if you know who, who he I've is, but he, he's, he's famous for uh, having gone around the world twice, uh, once in a motorcycle, believe it or not. And this was back in like the 1980s. Mm -hmm. where that was very difficult to do in some places, you know, and then the second time he went around the world, uh, he did it with this, um, like, uh, customized Mercedes, where he made it a four by four and everything. So you get through all this, you know, rough terrain. And uh, the last time he did it with uh, a gal who is now his wife. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're talking about going through some stressful times, I think that's like the ultimate uh, to drive around the entire world in a four by four, uh, you know, with, with your girlfriend. And if, uh, you're good to go after that, I, th I think you're, you're pretty much good to go. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good test. Cause you know, he had this mission to drive around the world and I'm assuming he brought the girlfriend in the car because, um, on the back of the bike would be problematic. With storage, well, no, the, the but... well, the first one that he did, he did it with a gal that I don't think he married. It was a okay. girlfriend and he did it on a motorcycle, but she, she, they both had motorcycles. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. But, but I mean, if you bring her along for that, for that kind of journey, um, there's a lot of things that happen on road trips. Like I like to do rallies. I don't know about you, you, you know, with your supercar, but I like to do rallies with mine and usually my co-driver is my chick. Um, hmm. and it's interesting to see how she responds. One of my good friends said to me the other day, um, you know, he's part of the Porsche club and he says to me something along the lines of, yeah, you know, I'm having a hard time seeing these, these girls. There's a lot of problems, red flags, just that. And the other thing he goes, you know what my litmus test is right now, Rich is, can I see myself on a five day rally with her in the passenger seat? Yeah. That's a pretty good starting point. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's an interesting test. And I think it goes back to, you know, when we're talking about uh, the, the problem of, uh, of, of marriage, of starting a family, you know, you're, you're talking about, well, making sure you're making, uh, make sure you're, um, you know, setting up this checklist, uh, so to speak, uh, and looking for these red flags to, to ensure uh, the probabilities are low that you're making a huge, huge mistake. Yeah. But I think as you were saying that, I was thinking about a, a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset and uh you know if you've got that scarcity mindset as a guy i think a lot of them get involved in a long-term relationship or have kids just because they think that's their only option and that's a lot of guys and that's the, the the best you know that they're going to be able to do mm -hmm. and then i think that goes back to pursuing excellence because if yeah. you're pursuing excellence then you're most likely not going to have that scarcity mindset that could um that could you know put you into positions that you uh that you're not going to like in the future what do you think about that yeah we were talking about that last night too so um you know most guys do have a scarcity mindset when it comes to women they think that beautiful women are a scarce commodity but the scarce commodity on the sexual marketplace and if you don't believe me go to instagram and do a uh, hashtag search on fitness girl on fitness model you'll get millions of results of different beautiful women Okay, so beautiful women are not a scarce commodity, but successful, 
competent men that can put a dent in the universe that are on a purpose that are chasing excellence. They're the scarce resource on the sexual marketplace. We were talking about this last night and, you know, there's an 80, 20 rule, you know, when it comes to, you know, the dynamics between men and women, and generally speaking, 20% of the guys are, are, are dealing with 80% of the women, right. but as women, as more women enter the workforce, as more women make more money, as more women have greater expectations of men, um, and they also have a little bit of an overinflated sense of self-worth and ego, you know, along with all that, and sort of, you know, pulls it all up the ladder. Yeah. Um, you start to realize that there's, there's not that many guys out there that women are willing to get with. Yeah, right? that's right. So why not be that top shelf guy? You know, instead of chasing women in your twenties and early thirties and locking down the first one that like kisses you or lets you touch them, you know, sort of thing, um, experience the world, you know, figure out what, what that roadmap looks like and be on some grind that gets you the recognition of being a top shelf man, you know, sort of thing. Then you're in a position to make a decision on selecting mother stock if that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's right. And how would you define a high value guy? Because you guys use that term quite often. And I think sometimes, especially from women that that's misunderstood. Yeah. So, so, so what is a high value guy? Because I think that's really the bottom line, what we should aspire to. Well, you can leave the definition to women, I think, because I mean, they start using terms like the six sixes and you know, the six sixes are uh, six foot tall, six pack abs, six figure income, 600 horsepower car, six inches in the pants, <laughs> uh, six months out of a relationship, but it doesn't stop at six. Like there's a lot of guys out there that say, Oh, women have a list of 237, you know, checklist items, but the, the total number of items that you can check off that women are attracted to, which really boils down to looks, money, status, and game. You know, if you can check off as many of those items for her as possible, you're fine. I mean, you're going to be the sexual selector when it comes to a relationship. See, guys are the gatekeepers to relationships. A lot of guys don't understand this, but men actually decide when the relationship happens. That's why women are always like, hey, George, where do we stand? We've been seeing each other for a few months and da 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 sort of thing. And you're like, okay, you know, I'll decide on that sort of thing. Women are the gatekeepers to when sex happens. So you better start acting the part and being fastidious with who you decide you're going to allow into your uh, life. I mean, Lots of guys make the mistake of allowing one of these woke, you know, sort of characters that are man hating, you know, let's crush the patriarchy, sort of purple haired, you know, far left leaning sort of agenda people into their lives. And they wonder why they get ground through the divorce machine a few years after when the kids are out of the way and she's decided that he's no longer useful to her. It's like, okay, well, you allowed that to happen, right? That's, that's not necessarily the fault of anybody else but yourself to start off with, right? Yeah. And then talk about how uh, important your your inner circle is, because oh, I know you, you've discussed that not just with women, but, but with the guys, with the people, with the individuals that you allow into that inner circle. I think so many people just do that nonchalantly and they, yeah. they don't even think about it, but, but that can have a serious impact on your future. Yeah, I'm I'm very like I'm very careful with who I keep in my inner circle. There there's guys, you know, to this day that um, you know, I've I've either trained counsel or I had in my inner circle that I've now moved to arm's length, you know, sort of thing. And they're surprised as to why. Um, and I'm actually surprised more guys don't do this, but you're always going to become the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. So you spend time yeah. with uh, five broke, fat losers that sit around doing nothing with their lives, you're bound to be the sixth. 100%. Yeah, right, right, There's right. absolutely no way that you're not going to be ground down to their level. So, yep. I mean, if you find yourself in a position where you're the smartest guy in the room, you need to get into a better room. And, you know, you can buy your way into that room. You can go to conferences. You can join an entrepreneurs group. You can buy a supercar and join a supercar club and hang out with other entrepreneurs sort of things. Like there's any number of things that you can do, which will put yourself in a better room where you can be decisive about making that move. But you also have to be decisive and fastidious about who you're going to allow to be in your circle of five, you know, sort of thing. And there's far too many guys I've seen that keep people around that, you know, it's just convenient. Uh, they've known them since high school. They've been friends with them for 20 years. They, uh, you know, they traveled through Russia together, you know, 15 years ago, but they've moved on, you know, since then. And their friend hasn't, or a couple of their friends haven't. Well, I'm not saying, you know, 
tell them to get lost and pound sand, never talk to them again, but spend less time with them, you know, be less responsive if they want to hang out and do nothing with you because you might have better opportunities to do better things in your life. Yeah. I think don't, I think you're the one that says this and it's a, it, you say it very well and that you've got to analyze and ask yourself the question, is this person around me an anchor or are they a sale? Yeah. And you, and you want to make sure that you got more sales around you than anchors. Yeah. Cause when your sails fill with wind, you can travel to your next destination. Right. But if you've got anchors holding you back, it makes it very difficult for your winds to your sails to fill with wind and pull you along to your next port of call. Yeah. Um, you know, but you can cut anchors loose. Yeah. All right. Great advice, my friend. Uh, we'll go ahead and leave it there for my listeners and uh, viewers who want to find out more about what you do. Where can they go? Uh, yeah, best place to go would be YouTube and check out my YouTube channel, Entrepreneurs and Cars. And if you haven't picked up my book, it's a bestseller on Amazon, The Unplugged Alpha. Um, I did narrate it myself. So if you get the audio book version, you're going to hear my lovely voice singing it to you, but it's available <laughs> on Kindle and print. Uh, it's a great one day read. It's, it's uh, you know, like I said, it's a bestseller in its category. So check it out. Uh, Rich, I appreciate the time. Appreciate the conversation. Can't wait to do it again. Thanks, brother. Hi, guys. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to the next Rebel Capitalist Live event. If you are a fan of the Rebel Capitalist show, I guarantee you, you will love the live event. The next one is Houston, where you can meet and listen to speakers, all your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist show. People such as Dr. Ron Paul, Chris Cole, Lynn Alden, Luke Groman, just to name a few. If you want to check out the rest of the speaker list and find out how you can attend, we'll put a link in the description below, or you can just go to rebelcapitalistlive.com. This is an event where you can learn to build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments. But it's not just about building wealth. It's about increasing your freedom and networking with like-minded individuals, fellow rebel capitalists. It's an amazing event. I know you'll absolutely love it. Check out rebelcapitalistlive.com, and I will see you in Houston.